good evening to all the participants welcome to this session webinar on uh, it's a topic which i have chosen because uh, there is a recent judgment from the recent directive from the supreme court and the ban on two finger test there are some say queries on all okay, is it a complete ban on this test or not so i'll try to enlighten you or give some information regarding that we'll discuss later on we will also take on your views and your queries at the end of this session so let's begin with the session so what is this two finger test in short in short we can say it as tft so what is this two finger test is a two finger test is an explicitly intrusive physical examination wherein a doctor inserts two fingers inside the vagina of a rape survivor to check if the hymen is intact and to determine the laxity and rugosity of the vaginal muscle so it is a form say a part of a per vaginal examination but in lay person it is taken as a two finger test as a part of virginity testing so it is done by inspecting the size of the vaginal opening for and for tears of the hymen to determine if the woman has engaged in or has been subject to sexual intercourse and if the fingers were inserted too easily there was still room for more fingers then the doctor would write that the lady is habitual to sexual intercourse that has been done by some of the doctors the test is often used by the defendant's lawyer to label the rape survivor as loose woman and identified as being habituated to sex so this the medical evidence of the past intercourse is used to cast doubt on the rape allegation and weaken her defense if we can her case by the defense lawyer so, so as to either suggest a survivor lied about the rape or to imply that the rape wasn't harmful Uh, or to suggest that the moral impropriety of the survivor and therefore her lack of entitlement to justice so all these aspirations a uh, doubt are uh, cast on a rape survivor because of a simple thing that the doctor has written that she is habituated to sexual intercourse now what is this recent judgment the supreme court on 31st of october quite recently last month on 2022 again reiterated the ban on the two finger test in rape cases mind you that it is in rape cases warning that the persons using such tests will be deemed guilty of misconduct this has been added that if persons conducting such tests they will be deemed that they are guilty of misconduct the court observed that the test was based on a patriarchal mindset assuming sexually active women could not be raped they also questioned that why this practice exists when intimate swabs and other practices of forensic value exist they also directed the union government as well as the state government to ensure that the guidelines formulated by the ministry of health and family welfare which banned the two finger test is circulated to all government and private hospitals they also directed to conduct workshops for health providers to communicate appropriate procedure examining the survivor of sexual assault and review the curriculums in medical schools so that the two finger test is not prescribed as one of the procedures to be adopted while examining survivors of sexual assault and rape so these are the directions which has been given by the supreme court recently so what was the case the recent ruling has come up in response to the case of appeal before the supreme court office used by the medical board on a 16 year old survivor of rape even while she was battling severe burn injuries the accused had set fire set her on fire after the assault in an attempt to murder on way back in 7th november 2004 this is the case this was the case of state of jharkhand versus shalendra kumar rai 
So in October 2006, the session court convicted the respondent and sentenced him to rigorous imprisonment for life because the girl wa was like passed away after a few days of treatment. So for murder, he was charged and the punishment was given. Rigorous imprisonment for life under Section 302 IPC and rigorous imprisonment for 10 years under Section 376 IPC. That is the punishment for rape. The respondent appealed before the High Court of Jharkhand. The High Court in January 2018 set aside the judgment of the session court and acquitted the respondent. So the, the accused was or the was set free by the High Court. On the one of the observations by the High Court was that the doctor did not find any sign of sexual intercourse when she examined the victim. Now, this was the deposition by the doctor at the time of examination. Here you can see that she has mentioned there is no foreign hairs found in pubic region, pathological report on vaginal smear, there's no spermatozoa, but a line has been written that a vaginal examination revealed that two fingers were admitted easily. And the other thing that is there in a deposition, the possibility of intercourse could not be ruled out, although no the definite opinion could be given in this regard. So in the examination, she has mentioned the vaginal examination, the examination, it has revealed that two fingers were admitted easily. And in the cross-examination, what she said that she further stated that the deceased may have engaged in intercourse prior to the death of the alleged crime and the admission of the two fingers in the vagina meaning that she was habituated to sexual intercourse. The Supreme Court reversed the man's acquittal by the Jharkhand High Court and restored the session court's judgment convicting the respondent. The Supreme Court also expressed disgust and stated that although the two-finger test in this case was conducted nearly two decades ago, so in 2004 it was conducted, it is a regrettable fact that it continues to be conducted even today. Previously also, it is not a new thing that the Supreme Court has given a directive or uh, expressed their regret. In this case of Lilu versus State of Haryana in 2013, the Supreme Court has held that the two-finger test violates the right to privacy, integrity, and dignity. It, in this decision, it stated that the rape survivors are entitled to legal recourse that does not re-traumatize them or violate their physical or mental integrity and dignity. They are also entitled to medical procedures conducted in a manner that respects their right to consent. Remember, very important, they should have a right to consent for any examination that is done on her body. So most of the time, the consent is not taken. What is the statement, who, w, uh, UN and the WHO statement? They are also against this two-finger test. So in 2018, the UN, the human rights, the UN women and the WHO, they have called for a ban on the two-finger test in order to eliminate violence against the women. They declared it a medically unnecessary, oftentimes painful, humiliating and traumatic practice. So even the UN and the WHO, they have given their statement that it should be banned. So there are yeah, there are many countries where this two-finger test it has been reported. So two-finger testing persists in many parts of the world, including India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Turkey, Afghanistan, Egypt, Libya, Jordan, Indonesia, and South Africa. Due to the increased globalization, reports of this two-finger test are appearing in countries with no prior history, including US, Canada, Spain, Sweden, and the Netherlands. So what, is the, what are the reasons for this two-finger test? The reasons are varied. The two-finger testing, if you can equate it with the virginity testing, they have been practiced since ancient times. 
which is performed in various countries for reasons that vary by region. In India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, the test has been part of the assessment of rape survivors. The law never explicitly required the two-finger testing for rape survivors, but it has been a routine practice since a long time. So in, in legal parlance, in legal, uh, say in IPC, CRPC, or anywhere, it is not mentioned that it should be done. Or in any judgment. For immigration purpose, this is in, in history, it is there. It's uh, before 1979, the UK followed the protocol of medical examination of women who are immigrating to UK to marry their fiancés. At that time, the people entering the UK didn't need a, any visa if they are going to marry their fiancés within three months. That visa is said to be called as fiancé visa. The applicants were expected to be virgins if they were not married. In 1979, in January 1979, a woman, Indian woman, had to undergo a virginity test when she arrived in London claiming that she was there to marry her fiancé. The immigration officer was doubtful that this was her first marriage and was somewhat sure of her having children already because she was 35 years old at that time. So there are some issue with the immigration officer that by that time, mostly the, the females are married. Male can marry at any time, but the females, they are of the opinion that they should have been married by 35 years. This practice was exposed by a leading newspaper at the, and the policy was quickly changed. So what are the reasons? The other reasons, virginity test is used in some cultures to determine a bride virginity before she is married, still being used in many countries. It may be done out of cultural or religious belief that the test can ensure women are virgins, they are virgins until marriage. The test, they have also been performed on women who are accused of moral crimes or have run away from home. In Indonesia, virginity testing for female applicants to the military and the police was carried out during medical examination. The Egypt's military forces performed virginity te test on women detained during the 2011 Egyptian revolution in order to refute claims that the women had been raped while in detention. Certain communities in rural South Africa and Swaziland, they have performed virginity test, that is a two-finger test on schoolgirls with the aim to deter premarital sexual activity and to reduce the HIV prevalence. So these are some of the reasons they're seen in most of the parts of the world. And these are some of the reasons of doing this two-finger test. So what is current, current status in some of the countries? The Quebec in Canada has banned members from conducting virginity tests as well as providing virginity certificates. In 2021, Indonesia officially announced that the army will no longer conduct virginity testing for female recruits. In 2021, the, in 2021, the Lahore High Court banned the use of two-finger tests in alleged rape cases. The UK has criminalized virginity testing as it is indefensible with no medical benefit with the Health and Care Act 2022. Now let's discuss this two finger test under this broad outlines based on whether it is ethical or not, ethical, based on ethical principles, the medical issues concerned and the legal status in India. We know that uh, these are the say, four basic principles of ethics so on all biomedical uh, examination procedure, they are based on these four basic principles, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. You have been told about it. The students are aware of it. In ATCOM classes are being held. You have been told of these four basic principles. So let's examine this virginity testing or two-finger testing on these principles. So what is autonomy? Autonomy refers to the right of the patient to retain control over his or her body. Forcibly conduct, conducting a two-finger examination without the patient consent is a form of sexual assault, like any genital examination without consent. 
in many situations when they are requested by the patient, sometimes the patient may come for a virginity certificate. This testing is not voluntary and even the consent is not taken. So, what is non-maleficence? That is primum non nocere. It requires that the doctor should not intentionally create any harm or injury to the patient. First, do no harm. Virginity is not a medical condition requiring diagnosis and treatment. Two-finger tests do not provide any clinical benefit to a patient and have several harms associated with them. They include the risk of physical discomfort and pain. It may mimic the original act of sexual violence, aggravating survivors, sense of disempowerment and cause re-victimization. This can also lead to anxiety, depression and post-traumatic stress disorder, especially if it is done against the patient's will and without her consent. Beneficence, whether this test is benefit to the patient or not, the doctor should act in the best interest of the patient. The procedure and the treatment is provided with the intent of doing benefit to the patient. So this testing, the two finger testing or the this virginity testing in most cases is for the benefit of the other parties, usually the family intended spouses or the state. Being put in a position to prove to third parties that one is virgin may result in experiencing a sense of powerlessness, fear, humiliation, worthlessness, and lack of right to self-determination. So we have to keep a balance between this non-maleficence and beneficence. Harm may be caused by the doctor's participation in any act that is humiliating and degrading, the purpose of which is to intimidate, control, and oppress women. At the same time, it is a woman's autonomous right to ask for a pelvic or genital examination or an examination of any body part for the purpose of documenting finding. So clinic clinician must consider this possibility when weighing the risk and benefits of an action. So we have to keep a balance whether it is necessary, needed, we have to think of it and then do accordingly. The best interest of the patient. Justice, justice is usually defined as a form of fairness, a fair distribution of goods, the goods in the society. So it is not to be based on any caste, grade, gender. So it should be equal distribution, equal rights to all. Two finger testing is an example of gender-based operation and discrimination and puts physician in a morally and professionally complex position of acting as the morality police. The physician should resist pressure from any source to use medical skills in a way that attempt to legitimize violation of human rights. So all, if you can see that based on ethical principles also, it is not justified. Even if the physician concluded that he or she would agree to do the two finger testing or examination, their ability to determine whether a woman has ever had sexual intercourse from the physical examination alone is extremely limited, if not non-existent, if not existent. Published literature has proven that the physical examination of hyrin is extremely poor predictor and unreliable in determining if prior sexual intercourse has occurred. Because the hymen is a flexible tissue or mucosal, flexible piece of mucosal tissue that may be thick, thin, or even absent in some women. In some women, using a tampoon, vigorous cycling exercises and masturbatory activities may cause the hymen to rupture. Some hymen stretch more than others and will never split or bleed. That we have discussed some in, in your classes also we're telling you about true and false virgins. The vagina is a dynamic muscular canal that varies in size and shape depending on individual, developmental stage, physical position, and various hormonal factors such as sexual arousal and stress. But even the de determination of laxity of the vagina, it depends on, you can say that, uh, it has got an observer variation. It depends on the thickness of the fingers. Those who have slender fingers, they may think, think it as lax. But even thick fingers, they may consider it tight. So it, uh, there is variation with the examiner is also there. 
In general, a pelvic examination or a pervaginal examination cannot reveal with absolute certainty that a woman is a virgin or has been sexually active. In a study of 75 girls with a history of vaginal penetration, injuries to the hymen were found in 50% of the cases, nearly 50% of the cases, significant genital findings that is transsection of the hymen were found in only 20%, 15 girls. And in the remaining 80%, there was no increase in the hymenal diameter or irregularity or narrowing of the hymen. This is some of the studies that I'm mentioning. In a study of 113 prepubertal girls and 126 pubertal girls with previous penetration that reported on healing of injuries to the hymen, it was found that hymenal injuries in both the groups healed rapidly and often left little or no evidence of previous trauma. And uh, two gynecologists inspected the hy hymens of a cohort. They, they have the same characteristic of 28 self-declared virgins. The physician reported that the examination of the hymen confirmed virginity in 16 cases. That's 58% of the cases was inconclusive in nine cases and uncertain in three cases. So you can see that two gynecologists, there is variation in their opinion. Now, uh, this two finger uh, examination do not consider that only per vaginal examination is there for females. So the pelvic exam examination in females may include visual inspection, speculum examination, bimanual examination, single digit examination and or, or rectovaginal examination, depending on the indication for examination. This per vaginal examination is an examination done per vagina to assess the status of the vagina, cervix, and the progress of the of descents of the fetus through the birth canal, the gestational age, they're also estimated using this pervaginal examination to identify, they're also used to identify benign or malignant disease of the vagina, prolapse, GIT symptoms, dyspareunia, etc. So this examination is used for a variety of reasons. It is not that only the two finger test means pervaginal examination that is not banned. It's not that it is only regarding the virginity testing to determine the laxity of the vagina that has been asked or that has been instructed by the Supreme Court. It should not be done. So for all kind of pelvic examination, we need to have a consent. So this is just the basics that you should do. If you follow the basics, you will not be in, in trouble. So you have to take an in, informed consent from the patient. So we are, we are aware of it. The consent are of two types, implied and expressed. Implied consent is that when it is, it is limited to only inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. Beyond that, any examination require express consent, whether it can be verbal or written. So for per vaginal examination, always take consent, which is very much lacking in clinical practice. Uh, I will just uh, concentrate on medical legal issues only. So in civil cases, examination should not be done without the consent of the person. In criminal cases, the survivor cannot be examined without her consent. The court cannot force a person to get medically examined. In rape cases, survivors should not be examined without her written consent. You have to take a written consent in rape survivor examination. In medical legal cases of impotency, pregnancy, delivery, and abortion, most of the times they are the civil cases. The woman should not be examined without her consent. Even the court orders, you are not going to examine without the consent of the female. If she refuses, document that and send it to the court that the female has refused for examination. But do not force anything or do not do anything without consent. This is the what the, the guidelines of Ministry of Health and Family Welfare guidelines says that what informed consent to be taken from the alleged rape cases. You have to inform the patient that the medical legal examination may involve an examination of the mouth, breast, vagina, anus, and the rectum, depending on the particular circumstances. The forensic evidence may be collected, which may include removing and isolating the clothing, scalp hair, foreign, the foreign substances from the body, saliva, pubic hair, samples from the vagina, anus, rectum, mouth, and collecting a blood sample. So you have to inform them, that the, the survivor, that various types of sub samples to be collected from. If she is okay with that, if she is not okay, you are not going to collect. 
she has the right to refuse either a medical legal examination or collecting collection of the evidence or both so she can refuse either she may have come only for treatment so do the treatment if she refuses for medical legal examination you document that the refusal for medical legal examination is there or either she may refuse uh, for coll the collection of evidence she may undergo medical legal examination but refuse collection of evidence but that should be documented the court or the police have but no power to compel a person for medical legal examination against her will she has the right for partial examination so she may also decide on whether she wants to undergo physical examination and or or genital examination and or, or she may undergo both or she may undergo only physical examination and allow collection of bodily evidence so it depends on the survivor only consent should be obtained before examination collection of specimens release of information to the authorities and even for taking of photographs the survivor may refuse to give consent for any part of the examination particularly the genital examination if it is there please document it. in this case the doctor should explain the importance of examination and evidence collection for legal purposes however the refusal should be respected and documented so you have to try to convince that it is for the betterment for the case to be strong that needs to be collected but if she refuses you have to respect her decision and this is the observation which has been made by supreme court time and again the survivor's sexual history is immaterial whether a person is habituated to sexual intercourse is irrelevant for the purposes of determining whether the ingredients of the section 375 ipc are present in a particular case 375 ipc is the section which defines rape the so called two finger testing is based on the incorrect assumption that a sexually active woman cannot be raped a woman's sexual history is wholly immaterial while educating whether the accused raped her further the probability the probative value of the woman's testimony does not depend on her sexual history so to prove her woman's testimony to prove a particular point it does not depend upon her sexual history it is patriarchal and sexist to suggest that a woman cannot be believed when she states that she was raped merely for the reason that she was sexually active so it is a main the the, the mainly a main dominant society which says that it is patriarchal and sexist to suggest that a woman cannot be believed when she states that she was raped merely that she was sexually active the sex, the supreme court has also acknowledged that a woman who is a sex worker that may be a prostitute has the right to decide with whom she will have sex and so so any non consensual intercourse with her would therefore amount to rape now what is the legal status in india so way back in you can say in 2003 the supreme court called this two finger test hypothetical and opinionative most countries have scrapped it as as it is archaic this is old fashioned unscientific and invasive of privacy and dignity again in 2013 the supreme court stated that two finger test on a rape victim violates her right to privacy and asked the government to provide better medical procedures to confirm sexual assault and recently again in october 2022 the supreme court reiterated for banning the two finger test and it has included that it will be consulted considered as misconduct on the part of the person conducting it it condemned the use of two finger test in cases of alleged rape and sexual assault the so called test revictimizes and retraumatizes the woman but i am sure that still it is going on another you can say another 10 to 15 years it will take for if for this this thing to like be removed from the examination point of view because their cases will come up it it was the 2004 case that has been decided you can imagine that till now it's being done it will take another 10 15 years for the other the cases to come up uh, for maybe for appeal in the supreme court so again we'll hear this thing from the supreme court again it will come the issue will be there 
No, the Justice Verma Committee report, which was set, the committee was set up after this uh, Nirbhaya case in 2012, Delhi gang rape case, it mentioned that it is crucial to underscore that the size of the vaginal intruders has no bearing on a case of sexual assault. And therefore, a test to ascertain the laxity of the vaginal muscle is commonly referred to as the two-finger test must not be conducted. On the basis of this test, observations or conclusions such as habituated to sexual intercourse, course, they should not be made and this is forbidden by the law. And uh, on this report, uh, uh, there is an amendment was done in Section 53A, uh, Indian Evidence Act. In terms of this 53A IEA, evidence of the victim's character or her previous sexual experience with any person shall not be relevant to the issue of consent or the quality of consent in prosecutions of sexual offenses. Now, this is the guidelines which have been given by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, and it should be followed by all medical personnel who are dealing with the rape survivors. So the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare issued guidelines for the health providers in case of sexual violence. This guidelines this allowed, this allowed the part application of the two-finger test. They have banned this by, in these guidelines. So this guidelines this allowed the application of the two finger test. In 2014, they have given this guidelines. They have also given a format on which the examination to be done for the survivors. Their structured format is there. So per within examination, which is commonly referred by layperson as two finger test, must not be conducted for establishing rape, sexual violence, and the size of the vaginal intruders has got no bearing on the case of sexual violence. So time and again, many agencies, many uh, government agencies, Supreme Court, they have come up, but still it is being continued. So an intact hymen does not rule out sexual violence and a torn hymen does not prove pre previous sexual intercourse. The hymen should therefore be treated like any other part of the genitals while documenting examination findings in case of sexual violence. Only those that are relevant to the episode of assault, such as fresh tears, bleeding, edema, they are to be documented. But as I have mentioned that, yet this two-finger test continues to be practiced in some cases. And in recently in 2008, which is there, in, it was there in the newspaper in 2018, an Indian Air Force officer had accused her batchmate of rape and had further alleged that she was subjected to the banned two-finger test for confirming sexual assault. So I'll just I'll show you some of the MLRs in the report that's being done. It is, you can see that the, it is in 2016. This is the report. You can see that there is, uh, other than uh, the findings, you can see that the findings are missing. Only thing that the doctor has documented the vagina had missed two fingers, it's loose. And uh, she, you can see that the opinion, it, 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 uh, it has been formed as she, she is habitual for sexual intercourse. You can see again another MLR where it has been mentioned that vagina here admits two fingers easily. And in the opinion, nothing is suggestive of that she is virgin. You can see here, she, the doctor, the medical officer has mentioned that she is not a virgin and she is habituated to sexual intercourse. I'm not sure why the issue of virginity and habitual to sexual intercourse coming in the medical legal report which is not at all important, but the injuries and all the which are not been documented. And here again, another MLR which mentioned Vajena admits two fingers without pain. She is habitual to, in the opinion, she is habitual to intercourse. So in some places, maybe it's they being told by the seniors how to write and it's being um, done as it is by the juniors and it's being continued. So this thing should stop. So this, the use of this two-finger test can harm the investigation process because the police too rely on the medical legal reports. Like in one of the cases, a pregnant female reported being gang raped in 2016. Instead of noting that the police did not bring her for medical examination until several days later, resulting in loss of critical evidence, the doctor conducted a two-finger test and observed that it was without pain and that she is habituated to intercourse. The police filed a charge sheet against the five accused for assault, intent to outrage her modesty and sexual harassment, but not for rape. As a part of the reasons for this, of this decision that of not uh, charged for rape, 
the police cited that the MLR to say that the survivor did not have any injuries on her body and was habitual of intercourse. So you can see the irony of it. Now, what is the interpretation of this Supreme Court guideline? Sometimes no, you will just read the uh, heading and you are confused, the ban to finger test. So it is not a blanket ban on two finger examination. You can say that it is for the you are not supposed to do a virginity testing for the cases of alleged cases of rape. You don't see whether it is virgin, the survivor virgin, not virgin, the issue is not there uh, in, in, in rape survivors. So it is in relation to the alleged cases of rape, this is in criminal cases. Even for civil cases of nullity of marriage, divorce, or defamation, examination should be done with consent and not to rely on two finger examination only. So it is not a magic one that you are doing do have a two finger and you say that it is virgin, not virgin, but you have to take into concern many other things to decide if it is at all required. But you have to inform the, the fallacies, the fallacies and the drawbacks of the examination should be informed to the stakeholders. So what are the drawbacks of this examination? Why it, it shouldn't be relied upon that you have to inform the stakeholders. So I'll just briefly mention about the examination grant. This is just a few points only. To ensure a safe and confidential setting with adequate time for examination and counseling. Obtain the informed consent. Be aware of the regulation related to consent. Very, very important. I think it is the most important thing that you take an informed consent for whatever you are doing. Don't, don't just ask the patient to lie down and do an examination. So you inform what you are going to do and then take a signature and then you are going to do it. Use a structured format. If it's not there, there you can use it, the one which is available with the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare guideline. It's there even in the net. The only information, the only on the information of the only information of the current episode of violence that the survivor is reporting must be documented. So whatever the current uh, regarding the assault that uh, is there was the survivor is telling that must be documented. But sometimes if there is consensual uh, uh, sexual intercourse, that is also uh, need to be uh, mentioned in your history because that may confuse the issue. Any information of past sexual uh, encounters is irrelevant to the current incident of sexual violence and should not be noted. As I mentioned that if there is any consensual intercourse recently, that should be mentioned. No clinical observation, external genital anatomy for age, tearing, abrasion, and bruising. This type of document is to be, uh, this type of, say, uh, the report should be there, you know, it should be documented in this manner, where it is the structured format is there and do, you do not miss anything. It is a complete document. You can see that this is some of the details of the act is there the whether the here the person mentioned the details of the asylum even the name they have been mentioned so it will be helpful uh, who has given the uh, history that should be mentioned and what has happened why is the person didn't know because of the lack of loss of consciousness what are the samples that has been collected and the opinion so this type of uh, documentation should be there in case of rape survival not a single page one in forensic examination of genital structure, mention the hymen, its morphology or its appearance and structure. Describe only what you see, do not interpret. Power vaginal examination can be done only in adult women when medically indicated, such as to diagnose infection, injury, or presence of foreign body. Two finger vaginal insertion to measure the size of the introitus or laxity of vaginal immersion, must, the vaginal wall should not be done to document habituation to sexual intercourse. This is the most important thing. In some places, it's being done, so it should be stopped. Two finger vaginal insertion to measure the size of the introitus or laxity of the vaginal wall should not be done to document habituation to sexual intercourse. Never use the term virgin or virginity to describe physical findings, examination findings. So it shouldn't be there in your report, whether virgin, not virgin, whatever, shouldn't be there. No, vaginal examination of adult female can be done with the help of a sterile speculum lubricated with warm saline or sterile water. Per speculum examination is not done in cases of children or young girls when there is no history of penetration and no visible injuries. But you have to keep uh, the, the patient consideration, individual consideration to be given. Uh, 
all patients are different. So the strategy, the, the strategy should be focused on helping the individual patient explore the issue within her specific situation, consider her options and support of her decision and choices. The role of professional organization is very important. Medical professional organization should issue official guidelines on the two-finger testing to its member through position statements or clinical guidelines. There should be adequate training, resources, and check unintentional failures to ensure doctors free rape survivors with dignity and offer them with necessary services. Now, some, what's the takeaway from this webinar? The health professional must be better informed and medical textbook updated to reflect the current medical knowledge. Informed consent should be taken at every stage of examination, in particular during the pervisional examination. The pervisional examination should not be done routinely. The vaginal laxity and the size of the enteritis are not an indicator of sexual intercourse. It should never be mentioned in the medical legal report. It should be and it will be considered as misconduct as been told or stated by the Supreme Court. Necessary sample should be preserved. Thank you. I hope it is informative. It has been informative for all you guys.